Yes, we're live. We're live. We're red. And we're live. All right. We? We're dropping. Are we? I don't know. I Guten was just repeating Morgan. what Nick said. <laughs> <laughs> Guten Morgan. Oh, yeah. There's the red button. A little red, uh, red light. Excellent. We'll do it live. Yeah. Welcome, everybody. Um, excited to have you back for another uh, episode of the Alpha Alpha podcast live from our respective uh, studio locations. Um, quick little update before we kick off uh, into the Alpha Alpha round. Um, so the experiment continues. We talked about this in the last episode, but I don't think most people, most of the audience has heard this yet. We are constantly iterating and adjusting the format of the show to uh, just bring more and more alfalfa in every way that we can. And also just even as an audience member listener, when we listen, we, we always look back and reflect what can we do better. One of the things we are doing now in the life episodes, if you're joining those or not joining those, we're going to be doing an alfalfa round in the life episodes that we do that come out on Fridays. So it could be that that episode is going to be anything from technology and science to productivity to life hacks to, you know, philosophy and so on. And then everything else that's related to money is going to be in this episode. And we're going to broaden it a little bit and try to bring the mind space of the four of us to the conversation. So Nick having this incredible background in business, entrepreneurship, e-commerce, real estate as an investor, Eric being a CFA, Stephen, of course, having a, a varied background as well, but being a professional trader, and myself now running a startup, just trying to bring these different perspectives to the uh, to the conversation. And then, of course, dive into some market updates and uh, always having one sort of meaty, juicy thing that we dive into and explore during the episode. So a little bit of variety and then one main thing that we really dive into and uh, and explore. Um, let's see, what was this little announcement? Oh, that's not for me. Um, cool. So um, other than that, oh, and one really cool thing we're going to be doing, we actually got approved for live studio time at East Denver. So we have no idea what this is going to be. But I think there's like a little booth for us or some kind of podcast studio at East Denver. If you'll be at East Denver, come hang out with us. We're doing an event on the Thursday of the event. Details for that are in our Discord. You need to get yourself a little invite and um, come on down and hang with us. But on Thursday morning at 9 a.m., we're recording um, live at the... Uh, 9 a.m. what? Wait, what? At the, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ouch. It's going to hurt. Well, no, we'll, we'll, we'll handle that. You can listen to the recording, everybody. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that'll be that'll be really fun. It'll probably be something pretty, you know, East Denver focused and... Uh, Maybe there will be a special guest of some kind that we'll pull out from the from the crowd somewhere, some crypto king, and uh, <laughs> we'll have a good time. All right, anything else or dive into alfalfa row? We're gonna do a do a little. We're gonna leave with a little bit of market update, right? There you go. Yeah, let's do that. Let's do it. Yeah. So uh, we're dumping, as you guys probably saw. A little nice, little uh, Steven, uh, nice flip to bearish, Steven. Thank nice you. Flip yeah. Thank you. I'm flip flopping, flip flopping with the best of them there. Yeah, you loaded some some puts yesterday and closed all the calls, so it was a good good flip flop so far. Um, yeah, I think it was. Um, we're we're sort of due for a correction. I think the market looked tired, and then I think the catalyst today, right, was the uh, the uh, PCE data. Did you guys have a chance to look at that? I saw a brief. Came in a little hot on the month to month. Yeah, I mean, we came in like 0.6 on the month over month versus the 0.4 expected, I think. So a little bit of a little bit of a hot print there. Um, also saw that like real disposable incomes up at 7.7%, nominal employee compensation 6.6%, which is like 180 bips north of a uh, uh, of trend, personal savings rates at December 21 highs. Um, I think the overall picture is that the economy is like pretty resilient and we're not having a recession anytime soon. And this is something we've been preaching on this pod for a while, I guess, because a lot of us follow the work of, um, of Darius Dale at 42 macro. And this has kind of been his thing with his research. Um, no recession in Q1 of 2023, but God, like it, it doesn't look like we're going to have one for, for all of 2023 20, now, right? And 
it seems like this kind of a higher er for longer er narrative is is taking shape. I think all of the cuts are now like out of the out of the um the markets and in, in 2023 that were being priced before. Um, so that was a that was a good trade if you you made that. I feel like I should have made that trade because it's kind of been a view <laughs> of, of us that we've all shared, but uh what, never, never the really jumped cuts? on that. Yeah, just the trade that just faded the yeah, faded the rate cuts for this year. Um so how would you have done that? Would you have shorted bonds? Uh, there are certain like dates on the, the 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 curves that you can kind of play against each other. I think I think you could also do it versus bonds. The the reason I didn't do it is because like I don't know how to do it off the top of my head, and I was too lazy to go kind of figure out how to put that kind of trade on because you know I mostly just uh, trade trade the coins and you know long the occasional dollar coin. Uh, so so I didn't do it, but um yeah, it's. Uh, Markets are not reacting well at the moment. Uh, it looks like uh, equities are down like one and a half percent on the day or so. ETH down three and a half percent. We're back below sixteen hundred. Um, it's tricky. What do you guys? How, how are you guys feeling? I know Eric, you've been uh, skeptical of this rally for for a while, and you're you're probably feeling pretty good this morning. Well, you know, it's a it's kind of a stark contrast from our conversation on Wednesday. Um, you know, like I think. I've I've definitely been skeptical of this rally. Uh, I'm I still feel like we're in a like a bear market. So you know, it when anytime you're in a bear market, there are going to be short term pumps. And um, you know, I think selling the pumps has been my game plan. But I am I am also leaving room uh, for the idea that if a recession is really kicked out, you know, say into 2024, then that actually leaves more time for these rallies to uh, play out. So it's, it's hard. Yeah. I think I've personally just shifted the mindset from trade. Like we, we've basically been trending for years on end, either trending just straight up or straight down. Like, I don't think any of us even know in our investor brains, what like a range bound market looks like. Um, but we've gone through tons of periods in the past where markets have sort of been range bound and I think people this year are going to maybe be tempted to think every time we trade down that we're, we're going to new lows again, when in reality, we might look back on this year and we might just go back down to 3,800 on the S&P, and then we might just go back up to like 4,200 on the S&P, and then so on and so forth. And then crypto can kind of go up and down in that ride. And crypto especially is something we've never really done a range bound market, and we just go straight up and then straight, <laughs> straight down and then... Um, I guess you could argue some of the bear markets are just kind of dead flat line, but I, I think this could be like a you know a higher volatility um, range bound thing that we're trading in. It'll be a you know potentially something for everybody uh, to to adjust to in that regard. I think the the crux of the range bound is is coming from these sort of like push pull forces. Um, like the data today pushes off recession, and you know normally in real life when we were saying we're pushing recession off and recession risk is going down. Normally those things are kind of bullish, right? Um, and in, in this instance, we're like worried about this credit cycle downturn kind of happening, something kind of really breaking in the markets. And this pushes that off, which I think is bullish, right? But then the other side of that coin is that hot markets may lead to more inflation, may lead to more Fed tightening, uh, more than what's currently priced in, uh, negative liquidity. And that's bearish. So we're kind of getting whipsawed between these like bullish and bearish forces right now, uh, as I see it. And I don't think we're really sure where we're going to go uh, at the moment. And it's the type of thing that if you, you you trade and think about too much can make you a little bit crazy, you know? Yeah. I mean, we talked about a lot, like late last year, how 2023 could be this uh, range bound whipsaw and just like really tough to, to play in. Um, kind of with Eric, like just trading, um, selling rips, primarily in the in equities. Um, not really touching too much of the crypto bag, just because it's I'm really still stuck with my long only bag. There's mm -hmm. there's you know a little bit of money to play around with and and trade probably, but yeah. So so far it feels good that I kind of like took some money off around 4100, you know ish. Um, but it could certainly go back up to 4,300, 4,400. And if it does, I think I'm going to be prone to take some more off. Um, and yeah, I'm kind of the same boat as you, like if, if this kind of 
the same narrative continues and we're not going in recession, it does make me nervous that, you know, the Fed will continue hiking until they break something and that eventual fall down might, might be a little brutal. Um, but who knows, we, we're gonna have plenty of time to kind of monitor this thing. And I guess the next checkpoint is that like middle of March, uh, area. Cause we have a few things coming up. We have this, uh, FOMC meeting and it's particularly important because they do those, uh, those dot plots where, you know, each individual fed president says, this is where I see interest rates going on, on a graph. And that's usually where, um, you know, the market takes that, I think, more seriously than interviews. And that's where the kind of the market and the Fed kind of start, maybe start to align. So I don't know what, if the Fed's going to come down or the market's going to come to it, but that's a, a key moment. And then for those of you tracking the the flows narrative from, from Chem, it sounds like, you know, his kind of uh, window of weakness kind of ends towards that February OPEX, which is, which I think is like March 17th, a day, a day or two after the, the Fed FOMC meeting. So I don't know. I think uh, kind of sticking to the, the same game plan and just seeing where where we go for the next three weeks or so. Yeah, I like it. And one more thing to build on what you said. Um, I'm kind of of the mindset now that we, if, if you're if you're bullish on crypto, and and, and I still am, um, to be clear, in in the medium term, I would love to buy a little bit lower. Um, but I'm looking at the possibility now that we sort of could get like a mini capitulation kind of heading into March, there could be some like peak fear, panic happening with all this stuff on the calendar. Um, but then we have that March OPEX date, um, that quarterly OPEX date at the end of the month. Um, so buying some like really nasty sell-offs in the middle of March, and then maybe you have those tailwinds behind you coming into the end of the month, coming to the end of the quarter. Um, I've got that as a possible scenario that I'm looking at, like a you know potentially good time to kind of step in and 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 accumulate some stuff, um, not just for a trade, but even I think it'd be warranted to put some long-term bags there. Um, Calcium wanted to ask about uh, short-term, long-term treasury investments in the chat, so I guess we could touch on this real quick because I, I, I yeah. have done something here. I mean. Uh, yeah, earlier in the year, end of last year, actually, I talked about how I was, um, you know, moving some money into TLT, um, and Eric and I had a little discussion about it. I ultimately ended up deciding I wanted to be, um, on the, you know, on the shorter part of the, 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 the closer part of the curve, the front end. Um, so I, I put everything in 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 six months, and you know, ultimately decided that if we have some sort of like resilient economy and rebound, which is kind of what we were talking about, that's not going to be great for, for rates. You can see rates tick up and then you can see your, you know, the, the value of your bonds tick down, TLT goes down. Um, so I, I, I parked uh, my like kind of safe bag in the six months getting like, you know, 4.5 or 4.6% or whatever it was at the time, because I, I kind of did want to keep a chunk of cash, like for like the end of the year, uh, in, in case I needed it. And I don't, I don't really care what happens to the price. Cause I'm seeing the bonds through to their, you know, their entire duration. Um, so that's what I did there. What, uh, what vehicle are you using to buy the, the six months? It's some PIMCO fund. I need to, uh, I need to double check on it, but the average, their average duration of the fund is like under, under six months. Um, so, or you, okay, I've been thinking the same way um, that is, I just want to own the short end of the curve. Yeah, uh, I'm using like an iShares version of the same thing. They invest in zero to three month treasury bills or, you know, like that, their duration is even shorter and um, it's yielding, you know, 4.5 or 4.75, whatever the Juicy. prevailing Fed funds rate is. So Juicy. If, uh, if, if those keep rising, then I participate in, in the yield because they'll just roll them over. Um, I've heard an interesting. And, uh, have you guys heard the uh, the theory that they they what the Fed is doing is actually stimulative because it's just giving like rich people this gigantic cash cow where they can just park these massive amount of savings and make like a free five percent. Yeah, like essentially their their losses on their balance sheet of how much like interest they're they're essentially like paying out. Is that what you're referring to? It's just like like people have a lot of cash right now, and when you before like we didn't have cash flow, we just bought things, and number went up a lot. But now you're get, like if somebody's got a million in cash sitting on the sideline, you're just giving them like a free, just absolute free, like fifty thousand dollars a year. <laughs> they got ten million, they got five hundred k 
K a year, right? Like I, th that's having some stimulative impact in some area of the, of the economy. But I got the auto right. compounding on though. I got yeah. the auto compounding on. So that, that stuff's going to stay in cash. Doesn't All it work right. both ways though? Because when, I mean, like when interest rates were zero and you couldn't get this $50,000 for free, like then you were pumping in the capital gains department. Stimulative so, to the economy versus stimulative to, you're talking about forcing people into assets, but right. this is like so, kind of just forcing more, like people just have more free cash flow, um, generally yeah. speaking. Um, yeah. uh, anyway, you want to move, uh, move? Oh, you got one more thing? Yeah, just one more yeah. thing on the, on, the, on the treasury and bond buying comment. I, I saw two different perspectives in the last two weeks that maybe I'll share. Um, Jeffrey Gunlock, he's kind of like the bond king at, at Double Lined. Mm -hmm. He kind of expressed his view in terms of what he was buying in terms of um, a combination of, of kind of maybe high quality um, corporate debt, which yields much higher. And he matched that with some very long-term treasuries to kind of adjust his risk adjusted return. But he thought that was like a very interesting um, play. And then, and I heard Bob Elliott say something a little different. His view was you don't really need to buy bonds until the Fed signals that they are going to pause or, or actually pivot. He says like, you know, your risk adjusted return is, is not that great. Like you can um, just wait until you know that interest rates are going to go down for sure before the markets rates start going down. So um, he's there referring may be some to stuff with like there, a longer duration, I assume than like six months. Yeah. 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 So That's, if you want to research more, more perspectives, those are good ones to check out. Cool. All right. Should we pivot to the alpha alpha round? Pivot away, yeah. good sir. Eric, we should probably uh, go first with you. I think you probably transition well with that. Okay. So we just talked about the market and how we just came off of like two months of, of pumping. And, you know, I, I can't tell right now whether or not we're going to keep going up more or uh, if it's going down. But the way I like to express um, this in, in my portfolio, this like sort of uncertainty is to balance it, right? So I, I maintain long positions and stuff that I like. And I look for shorts in things that I don't like that I think are overvalued. So <clears throat> I'm going to share one today that I, I think belongs in like this short basket um, that you can profit off of if the if the market's going down. So the one that I'm looking at is called QuantumScape QS. It's like battery <laughs> EV technology. Um, Nick actually has a startup that competes with this company. So he, I think this will actually be best for you, dude. Because if if you're long in your private private portfolio to like EV battery tech, like I think going short something like this makes a lot of sense. No, QuantumScape. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is the, the alpha is what you're about to say. This, I'll, I'll add on after you, you go through this. Yeah, yeah. So QuantumScape um, really benefited from like the bull market euphoria. When they came public, um, they basically said that they don't expect to have revenue until 2025 or 2026. Um, but the, the valuation of the company went up to like 16 billion. It's, it's now down substantially from there, but still at, at like a $4 billion market cap. Um, I think that's just ridiculous. Um, they haven't generated a single dollar of revenue. They've burned through $2.5 billion of uh, additional paid in capital. They continue to burn through like half a billion dollars a year in operating expense with no clear line of sight on how they're going to actually make any money. And, um, you know, I think there there is a long-term bull thesis, like EVs are, are proliferating and are going to be more and more of a thing going forward, but that's like a long-term transition. And, you know, I think in this environment, like you got to realize that the re regime has changed. Like you don't want to be in highly speculative stuff playing like a long-term uh, euphoria type type investment. So, you know, quantum scape now trading at $9 and 30 cents, that's up almost a hundred percent from where it was at December 31st. And, you know, like I, I think, this belongs in a short basket. How I probably plan on playing it is uh, just selling my out of the money calls weekly, collecting my acorns. And, you know, if this thing <laughs> does pump, then I'll lose those contracts and be short, you know, on any pump. Yeah. I mean, this, this is smart just from knowing a little of the insides of like uh, the, the battery business. Um, you know, th this company started off with like a, the future of like a sodium battery, which is 
years away from from commercial applications like 2025 is kind of a joke that they would even say that you know a dollar of revenue is going to come in then they've had to shift back to like lithium iron phosphate which is kind of what you typically see in like evs now but still no no like direct path i even for entertainment i was on a call and i was reading their press releases just to see how fugazi the the copy was in, in the in the press release and how they're gonna you know wordsmith their way to like well we're still on a path and a mission to develop technology um so anyway uh i like this from a fundamental aspect too all right awesome good alfalfa um yeah i guess i'll go next i wanted to talk a little bit today um I feel like I've been going like really in the weeds in some past uh, chats and going a little crazy on the chart. So I want to zoom out a little bit, talk about just some higher level investing strategy that might be, you know, kind of duh for, for, for you and me, but maybe useful to a lot of people out there. Um, the, the first concept when you're investing in crypto, when you're investing in general, is you want to sort of be thinking about what, 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 your, what your benchmark is, right? Um, like in crypto, I would argue like, for, well, for me, like my benchmark is like the NASDAQ. I kind of view crypto as like a tech play, right? And as an investor, you always have the ability to sort of like passively invest in an index and just like achieve the long-term expected returns of that index, you know? Um, so if I'm going to put all this effort into crypto investing, like I better A, make damn sure that I'm going to um, beat the NASDAQ. Right. And, uh, you know, for that reason, like I often will chart stuff against stocks. I think it kind of gives like an interesting perspective on where the market as a whole is versus, you know, what I consider to be, um, you know, the benchmark. So, um, here on the screen, I have, uh, you know, ETH versus, uh, NQ, which is NASDAQ futures. Right. Um, it's kind of interesting, like how this chart looks compared to the to the ETH chart. Like we were actually still trading like very very close to all time highs on this chart right until the moment of the uh, the Luna dump, right? And this was Luna um, right up here and like around May seventh, um, you know, on the chart for people who were able to see this at home. Um, and to me, this chart I think believe is bottom higher low higher low higher low, and like it looked like. ETH on a relative basis looks good to me compared to, to, to stocks, right? And so as an investor, like I, I kind of am very focused on ETH like, and very focused on crypto. Like I want to be investing in crypto. I don't really, like, like tech stocks don't even look good to me right now. Like I can make a good case for stocks going sideways and crypto going up. So that's kind of step one. Um, and I think a lot of people get this, but where people often kind of drop the ball within crypto is that they don't think about this concept within crypto itself, right? So within crypto, you could say that the benchmark for all of crypto is Bitcoin, right? Bitcoin is the largest asset. It's like the kind of like the, 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 the base model, right? It's the thing that has the, you know, least chance of breaking or somebody, you know, hacks it or whatever, right? You really can just go into a coma and buy this thing and probably be fine. So you better make sure that what you're investing in in crypto is going to beat uh, Bitcoin, right? Which is why we look so much at the the ETH uh, BTC ratio, which to me on like a very, very, very high time frame is sort of, I think now in this like re reaccumulation sort of consolidation phase, I think, as we've kind of moved up and, and I do expect us to go higher. Um, but within this range, you know, we could see ETH lose value against Bitcoin in the short term, right? That's totally possible. But but I don't care because my time and horizon for this trade is like decades. And I think over the course of decades, ETH is going to be Bitcoin, right? So then the next thing is, okay, people like to invest in altcoins. And I would argue that Ethereum is the benchmark for altcoins, right? Like, huge swath of altcoins are literally ERC-20 tokens built on Ethereum. So you better make damn sure that your altcoins are going to um, <laughs> out outperform ETH. So I mostly chart ETH versus the dollar, but I mostly chart altcoins versus ETH. And I think a lot of people don't look at the ETH pairs uh, enough. And it's something you can just so easily do um, either in trading view 
or if it's some of the stuff is smaller on chain stuff, you can use a tool like a Dex Screener is something I really like to use to chart um, the smaller stuff uh, versus Ethereum. And 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 in in Trading View here, like I've I, I've kind of set up a uh, whole watch list for myself that kind of breaks breaks coins down into particular categories. And then I like to put the coins in those categories and sort of sort them on the basis of how good I think the ETH chart looks, right? So on the L1, L2 section I have here, like I think the optimism ETH chart looks really good. And it, yeah, it's basically straight up. It's 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 high beta ETH. And we could talk about what that means <laughs> a little bit more. Um, Matic, you know, again, I would also argue is very bullish versus chart versus Ethereum. So I might want to allocate some of my portfolio to these coins for the long run. Um, I think another interesting thing to note here is that some of these um, old dinosaur coins, like the uh, dinosaur, uh, well, dinosaur DeFi coins, really, you know, like Aave and synthetics, like the OG stuff that had a brief moment in the sun and then just sort of died. Um, some of this stuff is like actually starting to look interesting to me again. I pulled like the Aave chart up on the screen and uh, this is this is versus Ethereum, and you know we're basically in 450 odd days of sort of sideways accumulation um, against ETH. So this is something I've started to actually just DCA into in small amounts. Um, I think there's like a thesis for some of these protocols coming back as we enter like this kind of multi multi L2 world where people start getting really attached to the applications they use. And maybe we, you know, start getting confused by all of the, the different layer to optimism and, and, and Coinbase's thing and, 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 and Arbitrum and so on and so forth. So, um, yeah, that's my, uh, that's my little uh, tidbit for people for, for the week, uh, pay attention to your benchmark, um, know what you're trying to beat, um, know why you're investing in that thing and then chart your coins versus your benchmarks other in it. Cause if they're not beating them, you should not be investing in them. I like, I like that, Steven. I All like right. that a lot. Yeah. Glad you well, like it. Yeah. I, I like when you go dip back to these uh, fundamentals once in a while, that was good stuff. I'm sure a lot of people got a lot out of that. All right, cool. Um, going to move on to, uh, to, to Nick then if nobody has any follow-ups on that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. What do you got, Nick? So um, I might've mentioned this before, but I figure we could go over it a little more. Um, I want to talk about like a security based line of credit. Um, it's something I've used in the past. And I, the reason I want to talk about it is because I didn't even know this thing existed until I started hanging out with a uh, little wealthier people. And then I realized they had this complete other financial tool that, that most of us don't have. Um, and I started using it and um I think it's uh, very useful. And so people should be aware that it exists. Um, so it's it's much different. It's not uh, necessarily margin. So people might say, well, you know, am I taking a loan against my securities? Yes, you are. But in, in a margin scenario, you're typically taking a loan against your public equities or your bond portfolio or whatever it may be. And you're able to invest in other securities. So you can borrow against your Apple stock to invest in Coinbase. This is a little different. With the securities bat in a baseline of credit, you are borrowing against your stock portfolio, your S and P 500 index funds, but typically people use them for um, investing in real estate. Maybe they want to buy a business, or maybe they even want to buy their own home. I'm sure people use it for boats and all kinds of like uh, you know consumable items. But I think the smart play is to use it um, for potential real estate investment or to be your own mortgage lender potentially. Um, instead of uh, taking a mortgage from a big bank, you can be your own uh, bank. And the reason why that's that's useful is because they're incredibly cheap. Um, first of all, there's no other fees related to taking out this kind of loan other than the interest you pay, which is rare in loans. There's origination fees and all kinds of other fees that come to play that, that can really uh, dig into your returns. Um, so the the interest rates are are notably cheap. You know they're typically cheaper than than margin loans. Um, they're based off of SOFR rates, which is the secured overnight financing rate. You, it replaced LIBOR, um, but you know you, you might be able to get a rate that's SOFR plus um, plus one percent. You know, so right now that'd be like at around five and a half percent, which is relatively um, cheap. And obviously, when interest rates were, were much lower, you know, that rate was as, as close to 1%. Um, 
um, interest rate. So um, you can borrow against stocks, or if you've been part of a startup and you have concentrated equity, you could also uh, borrow against that. Um, but there's also other deals like the interest itself is is tax deductible, so you can set it up in a uh, in a um, you know tax deductible, tax efficient way. And then um, historically, it's been a really good arbitrage play. Like the the way I've used it in the past is, you know, borrowed against my stocks at you know say a one or two percent interest rate, and put it into uh, multifamily, yielding you know seven percent cash on cash. And you know the the stocks that that are the collateral, they have dividend yields of like one or two percent. And then there was some municipal bonds in there that had a yield of like four or five percent. So there is some really good, there was some really good arbitrage plays. I don't think you have that same uh, dynamic there with, you know, arbitraging the yield off your collateral uh, and using that to pay off the interest. But there is still some good, you know, yield if you're um, investing in in real estate. So anyway, that's just a quick overview of how I've used it in the past. Um, And I think, um, you know, it, it's a tool that you can use. Obviously, we're used to it in crypto. You know, being able to borrow, throw things in in Ave and borrow against it. Um, but other banks, if you have a larger, you know, stock portfolio, bond portfolio, it's a it's a tool that you can use to, you know, buy your own home, invest in real estate, buy a business, that kind of thing. Nick, I have two follow up questions. One is, um, where do you find these? Like, are you doing that through JP's like private bank? And then, secondly. Um, what type of uh, loan to value um, can you go up to and what are you comfortable with going to? Good, good question. So um, I was I was managing my stocks on my own and I realized that this vehicle existed. And uh, so I actually interviewed a ton of RIAs and I one of the top criteria was how, what's your lending rate for this type of vehicle? So I, you know, I went to Schwab as like a custodian and said, what do you have available? Um, but you can go to like, creative planning or any IRA, they, they typically have these vehicles as well. I did end up at uh, JP Morgan, the private bank, just because they had been better rates all around the whole portfolio in terms of like fees. They were not the cheapest on this specific vehicle. Um, there was a family office called uh, Pathstone, I think, up in Orange County that I, that I was with before that um, they had the cheapest. It was like Fed funds plus 80 basis points which to me was pretty dirt cheap. Um, and then in, in regards to the to the loan to value, um, every asset in your portfolio has a different release rate. So cash might have a release rate of like 95%. Um, your municipal bonds might have a release rate of 80 or 85. Um, S&P 500 might have a release rate of 60%. And then like an individual high beta stock like Facebook might have like 35%. And so that's your max and um you know you we we ran a monte carlo scenario of like okay um let's run 10,000 simulations speaking about our last uh, episode around simulation hypothesis um we we just ran a bunch of scenarios and said okay like in in these like you know world is ending scenarios do we get close cuz i just didn't want to get close i didn't want to have to even worry about it and so you know they were like hey you can based on how we structure the portfolio, put a little municipal bonds in there, stay away from single stocks. You know, they were like, you could go up to 50, 40, 50% if you wanted to. And, um, you know, you, you should be fine. Um, so, but, but that I think for on the, the, like that depends on your holdings, right? So com- as you completely earlier, dependent on your holdings. So there's like an average weighting that you'll uncover based on your holdings. And then you're saying for you, it was 40, 50%. Because I imagine a lot of it wasn't individual stocks, and you could borrow more based on that. Yeah, right? yeah there were like you know short-term treasury bond funds in there, but but any case, um, you know that changes over time. So every year we run the Monte Carlo analysis, uh, and you know just see like, are we at threat of, you know? But the funny thing is, like I thought about this scenario where I would have to put up more collateral or actually pay down the loan. And I was going to, I was going to sell those stocks and invest in real estate in the first place anyway, you know? And Hmm. uh, so if, if I got called, you know, and I had to pay off that money, well, I had like uh, six years of compounding um, before I actually had to pay it out. So net, net should be good, but um, it's, uh, yeah, 
a little more degenerative play, um, but uh, there's there's some like parameters and structure around it that can can be used as safeguards. I think if you if you play it smart. Nice, that's good. I like that. All right, good stuff. Cool. Nick. I'll um I'll hop in with something that take um, us home. Yeah, I mean, so I think a lot of our audience is very entrepreneurial and or has certain um, businesses and uh, sort of dreams that they'd like to, to bring to the world. And there are many paths to creating a business and there are many ways to fund a business. And um, for my entire career, I've always bootstrapped. Occasionally, we've done things like crowdfunding, um, sometimes rarely little friends and family. But going the, uh, and these are, the, the beautiful thing about these businesses is you're the boss, uh, the money's yours, and you get to pay yourself fat distributions. I mean, the real path to, to ongoing wealth, well, the real path to wealth is like, get a job that pays you $350,000 a year and <laughs> comes with benefits and security. But for those of you that, that have, yeah, very underrated. <laughs> um, for those of you that, that are a little bit uh, crazy and would like the entrepreneurial roller coaster and to wake up and eat glass in the morning, um, you can go this route. And there's another route as well, which is the venture route. And the venture route is the route that is most commonly glorified and what we imagine we're supposed to do before we enter the world of business because it is very much this walled garden and when you're on the outside looking in you only hear about this these these stories and of course this is not for brick and mortar businesses particularly or small you know mom mom and pop shops and things like that but when you're starting certain types of companies venture is the answer so the first thing to know about venture and i've been learning about this space for the last couple months so i just wanted to to kind of share some alfalfa at a high level and then maybe start to give more specific stuff in the weeks to come and i'll share my screen in a minute and share some favorite resources that i've come across that have really helped me the first thing you have to understand though about venture is that there's no turning back it is very much uh, the red pill and it's funny because this uh, analogy was brought to me just the other day by a fellow entrepreneur that uh, i guess went to school with nick and i back in the day uh, at sdsu who i hadn't met before and you know full circle we're all these years later and we look and, uh, you know, this this guy, actually shout out to him. I'll just shout him out. Ashot at ShopMonkey. Uh, ShopMonkey has raised something like $75 million in venture funding across three rounds. And uh, that first round was small. It was less than a million dollars. It was like six hundred, seven hundred thousand dollars $700,000. And so, you know, talking to someone um, who's been there and done that, first of all, was really nice. But he made sure to, you know, confirm that with me. Uh, it's like, you've already, you've taken the pill? Like, you, you know you've taken the pill, right? If you're going this route, there's no turning back. And there's many reasons for that. But what I appreciated about that is that um, it's, it's, it's really fundamentally true because the world that you're stepping into is completely different and you have to do it for the right reasons. And a lot of people do this type of thing for the wrong reasons reasons. So if you're going to step into the venture world, it's because the business needs it. It's because it's the type of product or service or the company itself requires capital to scale at that level. Most businesses don't need that. Most ideas don't need that. And so keep it you, for most people, you can just keep it simple, partnership, LLC, whatever, and, uh, you know, take your distributions and, and move on with your life because founder salaries are shit. They're absolutely shit for venture backed companies. Most of the people you hire are going to make more than you. Now, that said, you've decided you want to go that route. Um, let me pull up uh, some resources that have been very helpful for me. Um, how do I share this specific window? I want to share this window. Uh oh. Well, I'll do uh oh. This share Techno my King. Desktop. <laughs> uh, here we go. You guys see my screen? So, as I as I went down the world, one of the first resources that was introduced to me was a book called. It's a very short book, and I did the audio for it. It's called Fundraising by Ryan Breslow. Ryan Breslow is the CEO of Bolt, uh, yeah. which raised a shit ton of capital. Now, I think that it's a great entry point because one of the things that this book does really well. First of all, you can listen to it in like a couple hours. What it does well is he simplifies the process from a founder's perspective. And I think it's very important to learn about fundraising from both 
the founder's perspective and the investor's perspective. Very, very important because if you only understand one side, you're, you're literally just missing half the equation and you can get screwed very easily. And as a first time fundraiser, this is one of the hardest things you'll ever do. I mean, it's by far one of the hardest things I've ever done. And it's not easy. And it's not even the, running the business. It's just raising the capital to be able to get to work on <laughs> the business. So um, what this book does is it walks through some psychology and some approaches that I think are important, but also incomplete, very incomplete, because you can only do so much in two hours. And by keeping things so simple, he removes a lot of the nuance. And that nuance, I learned the hard way. I thought, oh, I got the answers. I'm going to follow this kind of, you know, this book's formula. No, I got like very, very, like I learned very quickly, like this is incomplete. I got to go back and do some more homework. So best guys in the world, uh, in my opinion, for learning about fundraising and startup life, whether you fundraise or not, why Combinator? Um, I don't think people realize how incredible this resource is. When you go to Y Combinator, first of all, one thing I want to get better at is including links to the things we talk about in our show notes. So I'll include all the links here. And, and also you guys, if you have links, just send them to Jordan and we'll, we'll drop them in the show notes for this episode. If you go to the library uh, link, the startup library has pretty much everything you need. And if you're uh, I'm sharing my screen right now, so if you're not on YouTube or Spotify, hop there and you can see what I'm sharing. But you can narrow this down. It's like, what do I want to learn? Management, fundraising. And you can narrow that down all the way to like, for example, if I want to build my seed round pitch deck, what should it look like? What should it flow like? And this all comes from some of the most incredible people in the world. Uh, Sam Altman, Elon, all the people at Y Combinator themselves who are former founders. And these guys are just go-givers, man. They're really there to just help the world build great companies. And if those companies are investable, they sometimes like to invest in them themselves. But there's incredible, incredible resources here. And um, further outside of that library, there's also an actual startup school that you can enroll in. This is basically a free online course. I've done this. It's awesome. You can connect with other founders. You can do this live. You join a class live. And what I think is essentially going on is what's in the library is just recordings and essays. Um, it's, it's a lot of the recordings from startup school. So like that cohort happens and then they just, you know, so if you want to do it async on your own time, you can go into the library, but I highly recommend doing the startup school as well. Um, the shit is good. It's really, really good. And then last but not least, there are so many other resources, but and I've done a lot of the dirty work of like, I have a ridiculous brain when it comes to this stuff. I first started at like the most macro level possible. I wanna make sure I'm taking in the best resources before I dig in. And then I even verify with other people what are the best resources. This for me um, is, is I think the real alpha alpha. So NFX is a pre-seed and seed fund that was started just a handful of years ago that is now become very prestigious. And I think they do an absolutely incredible job um, honestly, big shout out to these guys. The amount of materials that they put out for free uh, on their website, through their newsletter, um, on their YouTube is just fantastic. And there's a lot of stuff you can dig into. I think the most important ones are, if you're getting ready to fundraise, are the, is the non-obvious guide to fundraising. I mean, we're talking like long essays here, guys. It's, it's like little mini books and I've read them all and they're really powerful. The NFX fundraising manual is another favorite of mine. Um, and again, you're learning from former founders turned VCs. And I think this is the most important stuff here because they go a little bit more into the nitty gritty than Y Combinator does. I think they're a little bit more cutting edge, a little bit more on top of the market, not to take anything away from Y Combinator, but I just really like what these guys are up to. Um, winning psychology of the top founders. So they're telling you, how to talk to them. They're telling you what mistakes to not make. Don't say these stupid things and make sure you don't come and pitch me. Like, like most people think that if they're going to meet an investor, they're supposed to pitch them. And they're telling you, don't pitch me because 90 to 99% of the time, you're going to get a no. So don't waste your time pitching just to get a no. Use this opportunity with this former entrepreneur turned investor to learn more about how to make your company investable. And there's just so many things they go into, the right questions to ask. And then last but not least, say you don't need the money, say you're past the fundraising stage. 
I think that their work on network effects, of course, NFX stands for network effects, is the best in the industry. They've done a lot of work on this. They've put a lot of materials together, and I highly recommend diving into their network effects um, materials. So a lot of shit out there. I'd also be curious what stuff you guys out there in the audience have come across if you're venture backed or if you're thinking of it and what the best resources are so we can crowdsource this a little bit in the um, in the discord for other fellow entrepreneurs and aspiring entrepreneurs. Dude, so. This is awesome. Some good, uh, some good materials here. I had no idea That's that YC dense. had like full blown school. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and I did not mention this is, of course, outside of applying for YC itself, getting in, which you can do, you would apply, and they do two or three cohorts a year. I think it's like summer and winter. And if you get in, they invest $500,000 in your business, and you get to be part of this elite group of people, and you do it in person and virtually. Um, so that's like the Mac Daddy, and then they make the other stuff available for free. So whether you get into YC or not, they give it to you. So it's really good stuff. Awesome. Well, yep. Thank you for cool. sharing. Of Love course. It. So um, speaking of, um, great company out there called Coinbase is up to some very interesting things with this uh, base token. So i um, excited to dive into this. Yeah, it was a big day, big day yesterday. I mean, Coinbase uh, announced that they're launching uh, their own layer two, basically built on top of uh, open source kind of optimism tech, I guess. Um, it's going to be called Base, which is a great name. Uh, kudos to uh, Adam Cochran for predicting that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, I, I have one gripe with the name. I just wish there was a D at the end and it was just like based. To, based. <laughs> like how sick would that be? <laughs> based? Yeah, two, yeah. I, I wanted it to be based as well. I feel like it would have been a little um, better for the memes. Yeah. You're just to <laughs> David and Ryan for getting the scoop too. They got the uh, first little interview and rundown on Bankless. I thought that was pretty cool. Really? Oh, man. Uh, you know what the uh, the the real alpha was yesterday was um, was buying uh, the the base token that has nothing to do with. Uh, <laughs> oh yeah, you always got to follow the memes a little bit. Yeah, I think it's a project that already existed. I, I I think it's really funny actually. This 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 chart just went like, oh my god, <laughs> <laughs> just. It, 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 it spiked from uh look at look at this wick i can't keep scrolling <laughs> Stop. oh my god yeah this thing uh opened the year at 70 cents it traded up to 38 dollars yesterday in like one wick um, poor soul that was buying up there question uh, <laughs> question for you mr C cfa uh say you hypothetically know that your company is about to launch this like crazy thing that the industry is going to care about a lot and you also know that everybody's just going to trade the thing that's named it are you insider trading if you buy the base token on this news and then dump on retail when it's not your token the i i don't think that that would be illegal this is like not even associated <laughs> with you at all just a name. <laughs> in that case this is just a pure 500 iq play i'm by if, if, if any if any insiders did that um, brilliant <laughs> Guys, I'm really excited about this, though. Like, uh, yeah, what do you think? think? You're bull? Are you a bull? Yeah, long, long term bullish. I mean, listen, th their products could certainly flop, but in, in the progress, I look at it from like two perspectives. One, you know, they got 110 million users. There's like, I don't know, a million on chain users, monthly active users. So if they can bring on another million or two, or maybe more, 10 million, they, 20 they million. Have, what do they have? 100, 110 million users? Like verified. Verified. I think is what what the yeah. what the Not Jesse said on active, yeah, yeah, no, but huge because those are but there's a lot users, of right? yeah unique million. users, but like a hundred million, one hundred and nine million of those don't actually know how to use ETH. They know how to buy it and speculate on it, but they don't know how to use it. They don't know how to like you know pay for it as gas and to maybe buy an NFT or you know to swap it on Uniswap. So um, people. A lot of those people probably just think of it as a speculative asset. We know it of as like, 
you know, our little uh, local economy uh, money that we use. And so I think that's really um, exciting for people to learn how to use ETH, not just speculate on it. And then, um, you know, from the other point, like coin itself, you know, maybe not short term, but the long term, I think we all know that it's like a, a good proxy to play uh, crypto prices. Um, and, you know, maybe historically has been used to, to, to uh, you know, trade Bitcoin prices uh, via via public markets for big boy institutional players. By the way, I saw Michael Saylor on CNBC the other day. He just sounds uh, like the Charlie Munger of crypto these days when he's in these interviews. It's it's pretty pretty tough to watch. Um, anyway, um, but but going forward, like uh, Coin could be used as a play for institutions to to bet on ETH and the whole ecosystem, including staking including layer twos um and then the revenue that that being a sequencer you know that that comes with it so i don't know i just think it's exciting as like a this all-in-one you know vehicle to 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 play those angles for institutions um i don't know if you guys heard any bear scenarios i'd love to hear them you know or just like maybe not as bullish takes on it but overall it seems pretty exciting to me I think the we have like a, but we'll see. Do you, do you have a bearish take? Because I, I have something to add on that's not. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think it's good to stress test the bearish case. I mean, I don't think this is like. I think the worst case is this ends up being a nothing burger and kind of like useless for crypto. But it's not gonna. It's not gonna hurt us. But like in, in bear in terms of like it's not actually gonna do anything is like the the main thing people point out is the the NFT marketplace, right? which was just one of the you know, <laughs> biggest sort of unmitigated disasters in the history of all product development. I think when you talk about um, what they put into that versus what uh, they got out of it. But I, I don't necessarily think that's the right way of looking at it. Um, NFTs are a, they're just like a different breed, right? Like the idea that people might ever want to trade NFTs on centralized exchanges is, not necessarily a given it's like this sort of inherently um on-chain culture right and unlike crypto where there's like a ton of people who buy coins as nick said who don't know how to use the chain like the vast majority of them everybody who buys nfts kind of knows how to use it you have to in order to 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 do it right so there's not that kind of like asymmetry of users going on that you're going to like suddenly tap into there um, the other thing is that like they, that was a centralized product they're building. And this is like completely open source, um, you know, not obviously not decentralized now, but path to decentralization. It's like an open network. So I, I, I don't think that the two things are um, analogous. And I, I think it's easy to hate on Coinbase as well, because they have just so dropped the ball on 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 so many things. Right. But net net on average, like they have built out like a great product that has brought tons of people into crypto, like to begin with, maybe not necessarily on to the chain, but it has brought people into crypto. It has brought, you know, people into that particular market where they care about it and speculate on it. And they do drive asset prices because of that. So now it seems like a natural progression to me that we might take those people and bring them like on chain now. And this is like the future that we have to be getting towards. Like we have to get to a future where these hundreds of millions of people who like participate in crypto but don't actually use it start actually using it. Otherwise, this is just a giant speculative Ponzi scheme circle jerk that doesn't go anywhere and then all the coins go to zero, right? So you kind of have to believe in this <laughs> narrative that otherwise it's like, why why are you here other than to just swing trade some stuff, right? So um yeah, I I think it's an inflection point. Like as a as an investor, you want to be looking at inflection points. It's not necessarily right. Like it's, oh, it's up only, right? But it's like oh, like a change in the pace has occurred. A change in the and in, in the waters is here. And oftentimes these things happen during bear markets, and you don't see the effects of them until the next bull. We have so many examples of that um, in crypto, right? So. This could be one of those things, and I'm 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 hopeful that it is. I know Eric, you had some some thoughts you wanted to get out there. Yeah, I think you guys did a good job highlighting um, how I feel, which is like, you know, Coinbase 
has done a great job of making people feel comfortable using uh, crypto to the extent that they are, but only 1% of that uh, Coinbase user base is like ready to go onto the blockchain. I feel like we've ranted in the past about the, the UI and the UX experience for getting in, into the actual blockchain. I think this could be that that solution. You know, it could be like the Robin Hood that we were thinking. Maybe it's, maybe it's Coinbase's mm -hmm. version. Um, mm -hmm. I actually want to take this opportunity to highlight something else that we wanted to talk about, which is like beta. So Coinbase, the stock, coin, C-O-I-N, mm -hmm. is actually down 10% over the last five days. Even, you know, that even incorporates this news. So like the, what I want to highlight there is that every, every marketable security has two components going on. One is like a systematic risk component that like is driven by the fluctuations in the market versus its individual uh, idiosyncratic sort of uh, company specific uh, profitability risk and return stuff. So like Coinbase came out with this news this should be net positive to their to their earnings, but the stock is down. Why? And it's because it has this like beta to the equity market. The market is down, so this is now Coinbase stock is down, independent of this news, which is positive. So I think like it, it's a good way to transition to what Steven was saying in his alfalfa round, where it's like you got to be careful what you're investing in to know what what is the beta exposure not just the, the company or the security itself. Yes, well said. Do you think it's possible the market just doesn't understand how to price this? Yeah, I think that's, a, that's I mean, if only 1% of uh, Coinbase's users even using the blockchain, like how many like actual investors know what's going on? Um, I think when you compare it to something like other layer twos, you'll see that it can add like 100 million or 200 million to their to their bottom line um like that that to me seems like a pretty easy proxy to make I, but i don't think yeah. everyone else understands that just to add on to that i think i, I read an article it might have been on the bankless newsletter about how optimism's targeting like a 10 percent profit margin on their sequencer revenue yeah. for, for being the one that sequences the the transaction so i think shortly you know hopefully in the next year or two it'll start showing up in uh earnings reports yeah, so it's I, I think it's important to note that like I know I saw Adam Cochran throwing around that like 200 million number and I couldn't figure out how he arrived at it because like as you say like just because you are capturing 200 million a year in fees it doesn't necessarily mean that all of that is like somehow accretive to 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 you um right. Like Binance chain, I think did like, you know, about a half million in fees yesterday. You call that like 100, you call it like 200 million a year, right? But if the profit margin for those types of businesses is 10%, that's, you know, it's 20 million a year, which is sort of a drop in the bucket to Coinbase. What's Coinbase's valuation? Like 13 billion? Ish, yeah. Ish, yeah. Um, but I, but I do think that that number could dramatically increase. Like, I think that could go to 200 million very quickly. I think it could go to a, a billion, right? It's, it, it's, um, one thing I'm sort of thinking about at like a higher level as an investor, right, is like, where is this all going to go? It's it's going to start getting a little bit confusing, I think. Like it was already a little confusing using crypto in the sort of 2021 bull run world because you had Ethereum and then you had Matic and you had Solana and you had Avalanche and you had uh, Luna and you like all of these ecosystems kind of playing with each other. It was like, ah, and then they all have like different apps and it's not user friendly, right? And it's 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 sort of chaos. But I think over time that like that that can't persist. Like there has to be some sort of consolidation somewhere. I think like some sort of like eighty twenty or maybe other like, even a greater sort of power law thing where one of these ecosystems I think somehow consolidates most of the traffic. It doesn't seem sustainable that we're in the future playing on seventeen different layer. Twos. Like there has to be something, maybe it's like an application sitting on top of them that abstracts that all the way that connects the users. Right. Um, but like Coinbase to me has the potential to be that sort of like shelling point of all this stuff. I think um, they have like a something that a lot of these apps don't like none of these other apps have. Right. Which is a gigantic pile of real world users who drive some sort of 
revenue um, as, as they do on the Coinbase exchange, but none of that is going into um, crypto. So if Coinbase can sort of bridge that, right? And they can bring those users onto crypto, then everybody's gonna wanna bring their apps to those users. And even though you may have this weird ecosystem where there's like 12 different layer twos and like maybe Aave is on like half of them and maybe Uniswap is on like four of them and it's just kind of like confusing, they have their own native decks. Coinbase could be that place where everybody has to build their app. Like everybody right now has to have like their app on Coinbase, on base, because that's the thing that everybody's at. So if that happens, like I wonder if you could just see like, tons of the activity um migrating there and get this like kind of consolidation in the in the layer two world um so that's just something i'm sort of thinking about curious what you guys think of that yeah i mean i think you're definitely going to see it from the developer side i mean i think what became apparent the day before they announced it is that all of the app teams were aware that something was coming they they probably knew what it what it probably was they actually kept it pretty relatively tight i think because uh well they don't want to get uh, slammed by Gary, but, but all of the app teams were aware that this thing was coming and that, you know, they were all kind of signaling that they were going to be a part of it. So they're going to certainly attract the, the developers. So I think the supply will be there of, of apps to use. My question is what's this UI going to look like? So I know there is some DeFi component within the Coinbase app where you can actually technically have your own wallet. And so I'm wondering like, am I going to use Euler finance or Ave or Velodrome or whatever, whatever it is like, um, in this layer two, am I going to use it inside the Coinbase app and how are they going to separate from me that this is not a Coinbase application? Um, it's a, it's a third party decentralized application and you may not know who actually is the one who works on this, um, how they're going to separate the like trust portion of the, of the UI so I don't know, maybe things that come, but I know don't they already sort of have that with like Coinbase wallet, which is yeah, but this... I've seen it in the same app. It's not like you mm-hmm. you download a separate app and in 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 interact with DeFi um protocols in a separate app. You can technically do it within their you can take their... funds in your Coinbase account and interact with DeFi protocols on them. Yeah. Interesting. I didn't even know that. It's called browser. So like uh, the, if you're in the browser, they, they signal out your DAP wallet, which is different than your Coinbase wallet, which mm-hmm. is also different than your vault. But in any case, you have your DAP wallet and you can click on things like one inch ENS, quick swap, sushi swap, pull together. And yeah, I guess access it through some kind of browser. I've never really used it um, that much, but curious how they're going to, how they're going to do that. Maybe people don't even leave the Coinbase app and they're transacting on chain with their own wallets and, and whatnot. Yeah. I mean, makes sense to me. I, I don't think the future is going to be any different than the present. We currently just interact with apps on our phone right now. We don't think about what's what the underlying internet protocols are. And we want to interface generally with some sort of brand or, or company um, in, in doing that, because as humans, we want to, we, regardless of what we say, we want to trust some sort of um, party to kind of, you know, even if like, even if it is all the, like the sweet spot for crypto is like Coinbase executes this in a way where it actually is all completely decentralized. Um, we abstract all this stuff away from the user and we allow them to custody and back up their stuff. While at the same time, people have that, you know, oh, I'm that sense of comfort that I'm interacting with this company and this user interface makes sense and it's not complicated and all that. Like that's kind of the best of both worlds thing to me. And that's that's the 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 the, the huge question in crypto that we still have to deal with, which is like, how are we going to like abstract away all of the nonsense and complexity of like this ecosystem? while protecting people, while at the same time, like not getting rid of the stuff that we did crypto for in the first place, like the the decentralization, the 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 transparency and permissionlessness. Like uh, that's that's such a juggling act, but I I think Coinbase can do it. I I, I do. Um, Calcium had a question. What did he say in the chat? Did you think Coinbase oh, will yeah. come out with a DEX like Uniswap or will regulatory concerns prevent that? Um, I don't, I don't see why they would do that. I think Uniswap is already a DEX. It's already good. Like I, I, 
it seems like they want to be a place for people to build stuff and they want to like aggregate their users sort of, you know, to this, to this ecosystem and still control that user on ramp um, and like monetize, you know, that bridge from their, 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 their centralized users to, to the chain. So I, I don't think they have any desire to compete with Uniswap in terms of a DEX. I also don't think it's going to cannibalize their own business um any much than was or any more than was already going to to happen I, I i think the whole coinbase model is a little unsustainable moving into the future like i think like as dexes continue to evolve as people keep being like more and more on chain like they sort of accomplish what coinbase did in the beginning which was this like easy button i click button and i buy bitcoin and you just charge people like massive fees and abstract away all the other nonsense that's kind of what Uniswap is. There's no limit orders or uh, market orders. You just you just click the buy button and you you buy the coins. So if they're smart, they see this and they're trying to figure out other ways to monetize their users besides like trading fees. And you know maybe they pivot to being more of like a a bank. You know, just like the modern bank, the bank for like the the Web three era, the bank that bridges these two worlds together, or app or whatever you want to call it. I think that's like the the, the bull case for them as I see it, you know? So I have a, I have a follow-up question too. Um, we've talked about how if there's economic activity on Coinbase's chain, base chain, um, then some of that value will be accretive to Coinbase, the company, which would make me feel bullish about coin stock in the long term, if you believe in that narrative. What about um, the value accretion to optimism because they built this uh, base chain on the OP stack? Optimism is something I'm confused about, honestly, like, because my gut reaction when I heard about this was like, this feels like kind of, it feels like it cannibalizes optimism, right? I think you can make a very obvious case that this is super bullish for Ethereum, right? Like beyond the fact that base is going to use ETH as a token, and now we have um, Arbitrum, Optimism, and base, possibly like the top, all the top you know, future L2s all using ETH as like the native gas token. Um, obviously all of this stuff ultimately settles on the main chain and is bullish for the the, the burning of the gas there. So you are, you're, you're boosting the amount of ETH being burned. Um, you're also just creating the generalized demand for ETH, right? Like value comes in crypto ecosystems, not just from the the, the 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 burn mechanism but just the general demand for for the token like the more users you have the more people staking the more people using apps doing all this stuff just creates like generalized demand so um, bullish eth in that sense it's also bullish eth in that it's sort of a blow i think to some of these other models of scaling you have like polka dot parachains which i don't even know what the hell's going on that now but avalanche subnets which i think are you know still a little interesting um obviously the the big one is the the cosmos um you know the app chains and and in coinbase like the biggest kind of company yet to kind of come in and bring users into the space they went with ethereum and I, I that's super bullish but I, I have to look more into the optimism case i know there's some sort of revenue sharing going on um to optimism the organization but they they don't i don't think share uh their revenue or earnings with op token holders do they no but that's, look that's kind of how the token exists now anyway right Just yeah like but the meme you governance. know governance can use that rev share to 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 fund you know, other public goods. Um, but like, you know, outside of crypto, when you look at um, open source projects, you know, there are network effects that you want. And when you have big contributors coming as a core contributor of, of an open source project, it, it certainly does does help. You know, it, it brings in other developers. It, it makes big developers, like let's say an, another large company, feel comfortable to build on top of this project. So, you know, whether it's... Uh, Accretive to the actual token, I think it's certainly good for optimism, the platform, if you will. Um, Eric, you said something earlier that kind of made me chuckle. Like, what? What if we just kind of round trip this thing? So, um, you know, uh, Robinhood is like a good example of this. But even you look at Schwab and other TD Ameritrade, trading fees are now zero, but they probably make money from selling order flow. And that's maybe where Coinbase is essentially going. Like they know that the transaction business, the, tr the transaction fees are ridiculous. Um, they're high. 
they're turning those into subscriptions, hopefully for no transaction fees, but then maybe they're going to bring those down to near zero. And then they're going to start making money from sequencing, which is essentially like, you know, using and, and profiting from, from order flow in the future. Hmm. Man, this is really going to be wondering about coin as an investment. Like I previously have not really had any um, interest in buying Coinbase because I was always like, well, I don't know, just buy the the actual coins. Um because <laughs> Jim Kramer's gonna want to buy it, you know, like in 2024 or 2025. No, I wonder, Steven, I wonder what's gonna have a higher beta exposure to like crypto's proliferation. Is that gonna be ETH higher beta or Coinbase stock higher beta? Yeah, I was gonna ask you the same thing, actually. <laughs> kind of kind of wondering that i mean yeah i don't know just on a pure market cap like what's it coinbase like 13 billion and eth is a what like 200 billion or something yeah yeah so wow. yeah kind of interesting i mean the chart looks kind of good too it does look like it's just sort of bottomed and accumulating over a pretty high time frame we went up to 380 in the last you know it's a casual you know 7x or so um from here just to, to, to those levels. Um, there are nice things about owning stocks too. I think like as an investor, there's a lot of flexibility you have with like a brokerage account that doesn't really exist. Um, <laughs> when you're just holding uh, ETH in an on-chain, uh, wallet, there's, there is nice stuff you can do with your, like a, that, like Nick was talking about earlier, as far as like that, uh, access to capital, um, you have like, you have access to options and all these derivatives that you can do stuff with. So I think it's worth considering. I'm going to consider it. I'll probably buy some in my retirement account at a minimum and probably a good time to start stacking now, I think. Yeah, that's a good point. Retirement account. What is that? Yeah. <laughs> looks, like Kathy Wood, that. Uh, <laughs> looks like Kathy Wood bulked up. Kathy so Wood bulked I just, up? I just, do, uh, I just do what Kathy does. Yeah, on coin. Oh, she did. Uh, yeah. yeah. When did she do that? Like today. Yes, Her great right. redemption arc begins. <laughs> yes, please. Be something if Kathy makes it Bring back. Bring Kathy back into limelight. Oh, yeah. <sighs> Kathy doubles down on Coinbase after earnings beat. Man, she's such a good pumper. She's such she... a good pumper. Is she? <laughs> I mean, like, she, she's down on the, year, on the year, but like her, I mean, on the yeah, last year and a half. Last but... five days. Like CNBC will let her come on anytime she wants and she just goes out and sells. She also sold NVIDIA. Hmm. Interesting. That's one never, of my uh, that was a nice stocks little pop. Decade. Never, never touched that thing. Oh, you didn't touch it at the right time. <laughs> That's the problem. I like a, for coin, I like a combo of common stock and maybe some like two year leaps, you know, like buying some some maybe in the money or slightly out of the money call options way the hell out there on Coinbase. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I love the idea. idea of Coinbase leaps. That's not as a bad a trade. Idea. I might just go and pop some right now. Um, you know what I also was thinking about buying some leaps or calls on uh, is, uh, is riot. Oh, like as another price action play within the equity sphere. Yeah, are, are was they just, like a Bitcoin miner or what is what? Yeah, they're they're a Bitcoin miner and they kind of have like it seems like they have like extreme beta to Bitcoin, kind of like a high beta Bitcoin play chart looks kind of interesting. Maybe we can uh, I think I dive puts, into that maybe. a little bit, a little bit. Next I want to buy puts. <laughs> All right. Well, anybody else have any uh, other burning thoughts on uh, Coinbase and our uh, bald bald god Brian? <laughs> no, I'll just I'll just echo what I heard earlier, which I couldn't agree with more. Is like, um, some of some of the more you know really core Ethereum ecosystem people are oftentimes uh, a little bit hesitant to see certain new projects pop up, new applications pop up that don't do things according to the base ethos, right? And what we need is for things like this to succeed. So I couldn't agree more with that because if things like this don't succeed, we're just here 
uh, I mean, I, I'm going to say something ridiculous. It's it basically becomes like a, a ridiculous circle jerk. You know, it's just it's, <laughs> it's 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 bad. It's not good. If all we are doing is arguing over fundamentals and not actually onboarding new users, and there does need to be some form of consolidation. I really liked what you said, Stephen. I hope I hope that that's what happens. And I do think that like as people sort of in this industry getting behind certain projects even if they don't check every box is pretty important that said this is one of the best that i've seen lately like it checks a lot of the boxes and although i am also confused about the optimism thing uh, i i think it's great i think the value accruing to ethereum is great i think the fact that it's like by the way i don't know if you remember this steven you when you texted the thread you you said is it true there's an l3 coming and I was like, what the fuck is an L3? I think you accidentally wrote L3 instead of L2. I was like, oh my God, here we go again. Here we go again. Like just L L3s are a thing, sir. Well, I don't think that was an accident. Oh, it was not an accident? <laughs> no. Oh, you didn't do it accidentally. Okay. So you assumed it was an L3. Well, why did you assume it was an L3? I thought they were building something on optimism. I, I don't know. I thought there was some app or I didn't something, even know, you know they could copy. I, I didn't know the see. code was open source. So. That, that part was uh, enlightening that yeah, they could cool. just duplicate. Oh man, uh, by the way, I'm just forecasting like 2024 bull market run, like just a hundred scammers copy pasting OP stack into a layer two, dropping a token. That's coming. That's definitely coming. Probably, probably. Which is why we need to protect all of our, uh, all the the little, the hundred million doe-eyed users in the little, little Coinbase walled garden so they don't get shredded to pieces. <laughs> Bullish. Um all right, right boys. Well you want to wrap it there? It's a good uh it's yeah, a good let's session. Do it. yeah, this was good good all episode. Right. I like this. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, I had fun, had fun this morning. Uh thanks everybody for joining us live on YouTube. If you did that, we do this every uh every week now, same time, 9 30 uh Pacific time on the YouTubes if you want to catch the show uh early. I hope you got you guys enjoyed the uh the 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 new format. I hope you guys uh, like us talking about uh a little, little more stuff outside of the uh, hardcore uh, trading realm there. Although if you uh, if you really like that, then please come into the Discord and you know hop in the the Magic Lines channel. We do a we do a lot of charting in there, and it's a it's a good time if you need to to, to feed that urge. Uh, other than that, though, I guess we'll uh, we'll see you back here again next week, same time. All right, or guys.